And thank you for inviting me to the, this wonderful conference, Kamsamnida. Uh, I've been really um, listening to the other experts' uh, presentation and it being really stimulating. But I rather think my presentation will be a little bit conservative, not pre progressive enough. But I still want to share my experience uh, with you. Um, so I'm going, I have a three chapters for my presentation. Um, let me start by showing this picture. A conventional, very banal gallery experience. Nothing to do with AI. Probably makes you disappointed, but uh, I still think there is many things to think about AI and art in this picture. So I will start with introducing myself. First, um, I started my uh, curatorial practice in 1996. And especially early in my career, I focused on the areas related to digital technology and art. For me, examining the relationship be between new technologies and art has been an important means of thinking critically about both art and society. In 2005, I was a jury for interactive art category at Arthur Electronica, which uh, Jens Hauser uh, probably showed the slides this morning uh, about this edition in 2005. And around that time, I began to sense a shift in media art. One of these changes was the overtaking of the free and democratic communities of artists and programmers by big capital, such as GAFA. And the other was increasing number of art practices that were leaving the black box as the new media connected not only with the specific communities, but also with the uh, broader society. So, Reflecting this awareness, I curated International Festival for Arts and Media Yokohama Deep Images in 2009 and Media City Soul 2010 Trust. Deep Image was an exhibition that brought together works from different fields, including contemporary art, film, media art, performance, animation, street cultures, and emerging personal uh, broadcasting too, like YouTube. And Media City Soul in 2010, Trust, was a different edition compared to Media City Soul's previous focus on new technologies. Together with the other three curators, we selected works that were not about new technologies, but about multiple ways of looking at society and what we believe in. The exhibited works were related with nationalism, migration, and hybridity. And I was particularly involved in the story reconstructed in Seoul based on a script created by Blast Theory, a, br a British group of director, artist, and programmer, based on the lives of figures of IRA and German Red Army, uh, which the audience participated through mobile technology to experience their life. The early days of digital technology, oh, sorry, I didn't show the Blast Theory slide, yeah. The early days of digital technology and internet culture in the 90s were full of open-minded creativity, but this new culture was limited to a few who had access to technology. Although much was lost in 2000s by market forces, the field of uh, participants and activities has expanded to include different cultures and communities. And this has led to continued interest in how the relationship between technology and society can be transformed. So during the recent 10 years, um, I have curated a number of art projects in the community. One of them is this um, Akatsuki Walk. In this project, together with artist Akira Takayama, we researched the history of Akatsuki Village, an organization that has been a shelter for many Vietnamese refugees and created a guide tour to visit this place. Anyone can participate in this tour using smartphone. 
This organization has accepted people who are refugees and furthermore mentally ill, and who other organizations are no longer able to take in. As a result, there have been many suicides, and it has been difficult for the surrounding community to support their activities. In fact, however, if you know them well, and you will find their outstanding generosity that contemporary society is almost forgetting. The visitors have the precious experience of warm hospitality and awareness on human rights as soon as you enter the, uh, this place. So we use the power of storytelling and technology to blur the boundaries between the outside and inside of the Akatsuki village. The other project I'm doing right now is the Mikan Collective. Uh, which is a project to collaborate with farmers. I organized an exhibition in 2016 that focused on farmers and food and learned a lot of the knowledge that is different from the academic knowledge. When I was asked to organize an art project with Asian artists, I decided to use this experience to develop a long-term plan for collaborative project with farmers. Last year, we held an exhibition of nine Asian artists on the three topics, Mikam, which is orange, fungi, and roots. And now we are planning to continue without the format of exhibition. This year, we will repeat workshop and talks regarding our sensory experiences. This is tied in with my education and curatorial studies at university. Last month, we visited indigenous artists in Taiwan with my students. And in the winter semester, we will investigate how farmers and artists learn from each other. So it has been already um, 14 years since I have directly engaged with technology in my curatorial practice, after which I have engaged with the natural environment, social welfare, and education. What I have noticed is that humans with rational subject have been exploiting nature in favor of their own benefit. However, humans are irrational, contradictory, and make mistakes. Therefore, we need to see ourselves as dependent on other living creatures and natures in uh, living natures, living creatures and nature in order to survive. And science mu and museums as devices for humans with higher intelligence to know the world by separating themselves from nature and placing human at the center. Exhibitions have the role of enlightening people about the world that is presented by those with specialized knowledge, uh, like curators. In fact, modern Western democracy has focus uh, on the idea such as inclusion and encourage the uneducated classes to have access to high culture and promote ideas like inclusion through education and culture. However, recently there are claim from the field of curation in museums to this model. I would like to conclude chapter one with the discussion of the definition of museum at the International Council of Museum, ICOM. Um, the former definition of museum was the museum is a non-profit permanent institution in the service of society and its development open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purpose of education, study, and enjoyment. I think you probably uh, agree with it. The new proposal uh, was made by the subcommittee at the 2019 General Assembly with uh, objection to the term development and education. So museums are democratizing inclusive and polyphonic space for critical dialogues about the past and future, acknowledging and ad addressing the conflicts and challenges of the present. They hold artifacts and specimens in trust of society, safeguard diverse, diverse memories for future generations, and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. Museums are no, not for profit. They are participatory and transparent and work in active partnership with and for diverse communities to collect, preserve, research, interpret, exhibit, and enhance understandings of the world. 
aiming to contribute to human dignity and social justice, global equality, and planetary well-being. This pro proposal was rejected, and moderate new definition was eventually adopted last year. However, I am very much interested in this rejected proposal, which museum professionals spent several years thinking. Now, which model of exhibition do you think AI would be better at curating? So chapter two, AI and de uh, de-anthropocentrism. The definition rejected by ICOM considered the museum space as polyphonic space, a safeguard of diverse memories for future generations. In other words, a museum does not convey a single truth through systematic knowledge. That it is a place that, sto uh, that stores one way of looking at things and other ways of looking at them. This was very different from the role of a traditional museum, and I think that is why it was not accepted. Deep learning, which created artificial neural networks, is made possible by a mechanism that analyzes the result of machine learning by layering algorithms. algorithms. It increases prediction accuracy by layering what it has created. This technology does not seek to understand the meaning for produce correct answers but rather to calculate prob probabilities, including errors. In other words, the major evolution of AI today is that it has stopped aiming for artificial intelligence that leads to correct answers. Therefore, as is often said, discrimination and inequality reflecting the human world may be brought into AI. The same can be said for our science. In a sense, the museum which is constantly collecting fragments of the world, resembles the function of an AI. Eugenio Donato, an important intellectual on the linguistic turn in the humanities, has taken French novelist Gustave Flaubert's Pouvoir en Pekish with the dictionary of received ideas as an example of museum and library that attempts to imitate the world in a vain attempt. Can the world be explained by rational intelligence of human and other beings? The idea that everything in the world can be objectively explained by data science is what modern Western science has been striving for. Science is based on empirical evidence, objectivity, and reproducibility. To see AI as an intelligence beyond human beings is perhaps closer to a worldview dominated by a monotheistic logos. I am less concerned with whether there is intelligence beyond humans, but I do believe that there is an intelligence that is different from human intelligence. In other words, I believe that there are other ways to understand this world than science by humans, and art is one of them. Art does not require evidence, objectivity, or reproducibility, but it is empirical, and in particular, the common way for both science and art is observation. Careful observation of the details involves decentering of the subject as an autonomous organism. Observation, observing the details involves the need to view human beings and other beings as undifferentiated states of subject object. We know our body is supported by a vast number of microorganisms organisms, such as bacteria. This can be strong critique of a distinction between self and other that create all kinds of discrimination, such as gender, ethnicity, disability, etc. It seems to me that there is an overlap between art and science in the actor network theory, agency theory, or quantum physics. An American feminist theorist and physicist, Karen Barat, is saying like this by referring to the quantum physics, quote, Clearly, if we take quantum mechanics seriously as making a statement about the real world, then the demands it places on our conventional thinking are enormous. Hidden behind the discrete and independent object of the sense world is an entangled realm in which the simple notion of identity and locality no longer apply. We may not notice the intimate relationships common to that 
level of ex existence. But regardless of our blindness to them, they persist. Events that appear to us as random may in fact be correlated with other events occurring elsewhere. Behind the indifference of the mac macroscopic world, passion at a distance needs everything together. And she said, without any illusion of clean hands and an apologetically expressed their enthusiasm and amazement for the world and the possibility of cultivating just relationships among the world's diverse ways of being and becoming. Theories are not mere metaphysical pronouncements on the world from some presumed position of exteriority. Theories are living and breathing reconfigurings of the world. The world theory theorizes as well as experiments itself, figuring, reconfiguring, animate and so-called inanimate. Creatures do not merely embody mathematical theories, but they do mathematics. AI should be good at utilizing the coded data. Perhaps it is impossible for AI to write down in details of touching. There are multiple interactions, transitions, and becomings in the act of touching. Is there any way to count everything from this entangled world? So I'm going to, oh, can I stop this? Sorry. Okay. So chapter three, unknowns, vulnerables, and archive. I'd like to show a trailer of a film, which is originally uh, 105 minutes long. It is called The Natural History of Destruction by Sergei Rostonitsa. Um, it is made up of a footage film of the British bombing of German cities, in which 600,000 civilians, civ civilians were killed by one million tons of bomb. Good. Okay, so Lost Dita's film is only using the recorded image and sound without any meta interpretation through narration. The interpretation of the scenes is left to viewer. It may depend on where you live, how old you are, and what memories you have. There is certainly a message in this work of objection to the repeated wars and destruction. But as, as you paying attention to the details of the images, fixed narratives such as anti-Nazi or allied victory will become unimportant. And the fragments of images are connected to the viewer's own memories and experiences, reminding the vast number of destruction by humans. 
This is brought about not only by scenes of destruction, but also by details of everyday lives of people and expressions on the faces of young soldiers and so on. By observing the vast number of fragments left as records, we are attempting to resist the mechanisms of education and culture that are creating our memories. It can be said that what creates the power of this counter memory is the archive. It urges us to pay attention to the relationship between archiving and observing. Clearly, archival technology has powers beyond the human memory, for we cannot remember everything. Thinking about how we perceive the potential of technology to extend human sensibilities is an important point to consider when thinking about AI. We feel both expectation and fear of intelligence beyond the human. We are being pressed by AI technology to see how we can make use of data sources. Utilizing these as objective facts makes the risks associated with individual actions appear predictable and reinforces the self-responsibility. Objectivity ends rather than continues our dialogue. As a result, people will willingly try to follow data source. A society dominated by statistics naturally favors the ruler and large capitals, and life becomes even more suffocating. Attention economy, advertising, and labor management However, each image as a frag fragment is full of details that have nothing to do with objectivity or correctness. It is the appreciation of art that we find the vibration of our own experience. In other words, art focuses on this vibration of experience as opposed to objectivity and, and emphasizes the value of dynamism, of chance and rhythm. Statistics, which seeks to tame chance and phenomenological experience, which seeks to find meaning in chance. Vibrant experience is brought about by the limited capacity of our bodies and memories. AI needs electricity, but humans do not. There will always be, there, are, there will always be impossibilities for us and for AI. That should suggest the possibility of humans and machines complementing each other. The current AI boom is also said to have been influenced by the battle of supremacy between Google and Microsoft. As is well, well known, the development of computer science has been driven by both research for military technology promoted by politics and capital, and by the personalization ideals of hackers who took over the counterculture of the 60s and made technology usable by individuals rather than for power. There are many in 70s America who had been deeply scared by war and had witnessed the fragility of human. The utopian ideology they had created uh, was very strong in digital community in the 90s when I started uh, working in the media, media art field. The ideology of those who believed in the individual was driving the personalization of computers. But this is not nostalgia. For regardless of techno technological advances, our human vulnerability has not changed. In the wake of cycle of violence that occurred after 9-11, Judith Patra states that autonomy of individual human cannot be considered without the condition under which our bodies are socially constructed. Our bodies are socially constituted based on our experiences of loss and vulnerability she argues, and the details, oh sorry, and the death of those who are left without adequate support and who are not mourned create a cycle of violence. The obvious difference between AI and humans is whether or not the body is involved. The sense of a body are our tools for perceiving the world. We listen to someone's voice, look, smell, and touch to know more deeply and we exchange what we feel with others through words, facial expressions, and our bodies. And while our senses have been extended by technologies, bodies are always limited by time and space. Finally, returning to art and this photograph, 
The appreciation of art is like this picture. It is an experience in which people of different nationalities and generations who may be tourists or neighbors and who do not know each other come together temporarily to view work of art. Sometimes they speak to each other and sometimes they are silent or alone. Instead of facing each other, they stand side by side and look at the work. What part of the work they are looking at varies from person to person. But for a few seconds or minutes, we notice that other people are looking at even if simultaneously or in the past or future. The works of art created by individuals remain as objects. At the MoMA, uh, where this photo was taken, frame paintings are carefully preserved in 24-hour air-conditioned storage, storage. The people who look at the paintings are worn out from work and life, and their lives are limited. Our bodies are extremely vulnerable compared to the works of art stored in museums. We need to be aware of this asymmetry, and moreover, not only accept the values presented by museums, but also value the sense of pleasure and the liberation found by individuals. I believe that we can find greater meaning in observation of the work of art in waiting patiently until we feel something and spending time mixing individual memories and experiences without a clear meaning or interpretation in these experiences. In this sense, art is an imaginative process in which the self and others are not clearly separated with a feeling of empathy. In this respect, I believe that art will continue to be means of knowing the world in a way different from science and technology. However, as discussed in chapter one, the technologies that enable museums to exhibit and collect can also be associated with big capital and authority creating a single system of value and subordinating people. I think it is important to recognize that in both art and technology, there are always limited number of people who have access and who fall outside of the scope of inclusion. I am not suggesting that we should include everyone, but that it is important to recognize that those who have access are limited and are only part of the world. Only then can we exist with other values and other knowledge. My next curatorial practice will be in uh, Chiang Rai, uh, Northern Thailand. I will be working as the curatorial collective, Production Zomia, on the project for Thailand Biennale 2023. The region is a land for many ethnic minorities, and the drug trade used to be very active. After regulation on drug production, the area has designated as a special economic zone, and we, we see a lot of casinos are opening. A Biennale is being prepared in the area to attract an influx of tourists. We will have a small exhibition in the city, and at the same time, we will collect works from artists in, artists in Southeast Asia that can be freely exhibited in schools libraries, hospitals, etc., of various NGOs that work in areas inaccessible to tourists and up upload them to a cloud server. The number and selection of exhibits will be left to each organization, and they will be able to use artworks according to their own will. It is a way to decentralize the art and power. This is also a tribute. 20 years later, to a project called Utopia Station, which was launched in 2003 as a project to envision a different kind of society at the time of the rise of new imperialism after 9-11. We hope that the practice of art will continue to be a place to imagine a different way of life in response to the overwhelming power. Thank you. Thank you for your listening. Thank you.